Hi, very good afternoon to you and a warm welcome. It's Gene from Mavstar Observatory. In this video, I just wanted to just do two simple things. First of all, um, you know, make a special thanks uh, to uh, Tunisia, Jamie, um, Eagle Designs and Co, uh, Joanna Lee, uh, Kaylee Dew, uh, Samuel, uh, Lindsay, Jim, and Robert for you know over the last few days chipping in a few books. But if we just look at the amount of names we mentioned, it's eight, and over the last few days we probably had ten over ten thousand people view the video. So you know a lot more people could do a lot more. You know, uh, as opposed to just sit on the sidelines. You know, I want to also thank you know the, the superstars that we've got our equipment out there in the field. I also want to thank our patrons for you know sticking in there month in month out with us. The other thing I wanted to do is explain you know the usefulness of the data that we're collecting. And if you go on to poleshiftnews.com, uh, let's just say at Earth Alpha a glance, have a look at the archive of data that we've collected over the last three years or a little bit longer. And if you excel all the atmospheric CO2 readings over the times that we've collected it and chart it, you know, just say over the last 12 months, if you don't want to go back the three years, you know, it could take you hours to do it in Excel. But if you just put all the um, collective data on uh, atmospheric CO2 parts per million over the last 12 months, you would notice something very important, that CO2 is actually falling. And yet no mainstream organisation or mainstream media outlet have made that announcement, and we know why that is. But it's the same for any other data set there. It could be atmospheric oxygen. You want to excel and, and do a chart so you can see on the chart how it's trending over the amount of readings that you put in there. It could be the, the radiation background so you get an idea of the best fit line over time. You know, It could be the amount of volcanoes in eruption. Uh, it could be the largest earthquake, how that is trending. It could be the muons or any other piece of information that we get here would give you uh, an ability to forecast what is going on. So it's the same for the TriMag data, only it's a little bit more difficult because every month when we submit the uh, chart, I know it looks like sometimes a, a dead flat line, but it's not. If you look at the raw data, and you know, I'll show you if you're interested in having a look at that raw data, uh, you'll see that we collect in some months over 300,000 individual um, data points. So it's took a reading over 300,000 times a month. That's what enables us to pinpoint with accuracy the true location of the magnetic north pole. But the point of making this video is, is that you, know, you can use this data that we've collected yourselves. If your inquisitive uh, nature gets the better of you and you want to know uh, yourself what's going on, then you know, the data is there. It goes back in an archive of three years. And this is the only website that publishes the archive on these um, you know, um, anomalies that we collect data on, like CO2, atmospheric oxygen. You can see how it trends when you chart it. You know, we use the scientific method here at the observatory to collect the data. And we use technology to do that because it's more reliable than a human being and let's face it it'd be very difficult for a human being to look at some uh, equipment every three seconds and record the date the time uh, the amount of movement uh, every three seconds and do that for hundred thousand times a month you know 24 hours a day and seven days a week and 365 days a year it would be very difficult. That's why we used, you know, um, electronics to do that. But we didn't arrive here very easy. Let me tell you, it, it's been an uphill battle. And even though we've got the equipment, you know, it's a struggle trying to keep the observatory funded, even minimal on it, even on a minimalistic uh, level. So, you know, I really do appreciate when people like Jamie come, comes along and, and chucks a few books in. 
and all the other people you know but look at look at the amount of people that receive the data and look at how many people actually chip in it's it's saddening really you know it's a lot of work that goes in and it's uh, i understand um people don't understand uh, the level of work that goes into you know actually uh, updating websites and when there's just one person doing it having to do the electronics build the electronics uh source people to have them around the world send it out you know all free of charge to them you know that we don't charge people to have our equipment uh, some people have donated a few quid that have had the equipment and others just take it and in some respects you know some of the equipment like the muon detectors you try and buy one first of all they're not really readily available off the shelf and if you can get something close i know that there was um uh i think it was a neutron meter and you know obviously a muon is a lot more smaller than a neutron in in terms of subatomic particles so you know you would expect the muon detector to actually cost more but the neutron meter did you or the neutron detector starts at around about seven thousand pounds so that gives you an idea of how much you know some of this scientific equipment can cost you know co2 meters you can get for around 100 pounds atmospheric oxygen sensors we built it ourselves using state-of-the-art technology um, and incorporating the aluminox sensor which is used on um, civil aviating aircraft as well as military you know to detect oxygen samples at an accurate rate so you know it gives you an idea of first of all what what goes into collecting the data the costs that are involved in collecting the data the time that is involved the effort that is involved and then there is the other aspect of this is that we are very unique in what we do um, i don't know any other observatory uh, or private observatory which freely collects the data on these anomalies using their own equipment um, it, for the majority of the data that we collect and relays that free of charge back to the public and you know we just rely on you know some you know very kind people donating now and then uh, to keep us going and what that enables us to do is not bar anyone from the information think about this there are people in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Uzbekistan and all the other stands you know, around the world as well as other poor, poor countries like Ethiopia, Cambodia uh, that are accessing the information but there's no way in my heart I could ever take a coin off those people no way whatsoever because it wouldn't be right to do that especially in the circumstances that some of these people are in right now where they don't even earn two dollars a day they do backbreaking work for sometimes just two dollars or less per day and like I say they're not barred from the information and in some respects this information can save people's lives I believe we've saved many lives through people listening to this I know for a fact from reading the comments that we have uh, changed people's perspective by delivering the facts and allowing them to make the decisions on what they want to do as, a, as opposed to in the future protecting their loved ones so we've been able to give them information where they've been able to forecast their uh, future uh, place of where they'll be in the future you know and in some cases people have relocated on the basis of the information people have you know pulled their money out of certain things and invested it in other things more um, stable or more secure so I believe that we do provide a valid service you know some people have relocated due to the position at where they are you know on this earth and and got themselves possibly out of harm's way as a result of that you know some people have chose to go back 
you know, to a homestead where they grow their own food and things like that, you know, and be less reliant on the system. Some people have, you know, taken it upon themselves to get more security for themselves. Think about, you know, when times do come to crunch point, you know, how they will protect their families. These are some of the things that we have been able to um, do for people as well as give them the scientific information as reliable as we could give it. And, you know, there's a story behind all this. You know, it begins in the 1900s when the magnetic North Pole left its stabilised position and started to migrate across the Northern Hemisphere. And then in the 90s, it increased in rate. And around 12 months ago, there was a slight increase again in the rate at which it's migrating. You know, over the last three or four years, we've discussed, you know, this ever-approaching 40-degree mark. You know, late March, we'll be there at the current rate the magnetic pole is migrating. We will be there. And time will tell. It's a theoretical mark based on some experiments. We, we tried to do the best we could and therefore apply it to, you know, something like an experiment which simulates you know, something happening in the core affecting the uh, geomagnetic poles or the dipoles. And we are very close to that point in time. You know, March, end of March, we'll be there. So, you know, we're going to see in a couple of months' time. We're in January now. It isn't far away, end of March. And we're going to see what's going to happen. And it doesn't really bother me, I'll be honest. If nothing happens, you know, I've got no shame. You know, I've done my best, you know, I've put it down on the table. If I'd have kept it to myself and then said, you know, when the poles migrated, uh, yeah, I knew this, you know, months ago, years ago, that this was going to happen, I'd be called a barefaced liar. So I've put it down on the table and I thought that that was the responsible thing to do even if it doesn't happen, even if we don't get that acceleration where the magnetic pole leaves the weak field lines, sorry, the strong field lines which enables a slow migrating pole and it enters the weak field lines which enables a fast migrating pole. What I will say is I don't think it's any coincidence that what we've witnessed over the last 30 years in climate change also coincides with a time where there was a large uptick in the speed of the migration of the magnetic north pole where it covered more distance in less time so folks we could be witnessing one of two things we could be witnessing a solidification of the core where the core no longer is able to go through a magnetic reversal. This is not uncommon and it has been proven to happen on our most neighbouring planet Mars. This is exactly what happened on Mars. The volcanic activity stopped, the, the core solidified, the magnetosphere collapsed and then it scrubbed away the upper atmosphere and then removed the liquid water on its surface. And we know, as scientists, um, that on Mars, if you look at the terraform, there are, you know, without a doubt, signs of erosion over thousands of years where water was flowing on Mars, carving out those riverbeds. We can see them to this day. Yet, yeah, Mars lost its magnetosphere. And as the magnetic pole is half a million years overdue, the pole migration is half a million years overdue, that worries me a little. Because if we're subjected to, you know, the same as what happened to Mars, then it is lights out for humanity and all biodiversity on this planet. NASA have got a term for this. They call it sputtering. 
and there is a mission which doesn't really uh, get into mainstream media for some reason it's called the Mavin mission and what they're doing is they are examining on both Mars and Venus uh, what is left of the composition of the uh, atmosphere on both these planets and trying to work out whether there is a connection as to what is taking place on our own Earth. You know, it's well worth having a look. I think on the Learning Centre on uh, Pole Shift News there is a video there which briefly you know, gives you the idea of what's going on with sputtering which is when a magnetosphere collapses how the solar radiation and inter um, uh, solar uh, radiation affects the atmosphere in, in as far as stripping it away so uh, you know that's well worth you going over there and having a look at so you know remember this you know the data that we collect we add every time we don't re remove the old data we leave it up there as an archive and that is so that you can come along if you want and let's say you're interested in volcanic activity you can put in all the um, results of how many volcanoes have been erupted and you'll find out whether there's something to worry about the amount of volcanoes that are in eruption and you can do that likewise with the background radiation um, you know you can pin the latitude and longitude positions of the magnetic current pole positions over the time periods that we've got you can also do it with the oxygen and CO2 and you can come to your own conclusions but you know just think about this CO2 has fallen over the last 12 months zero mention of it and that's because the CO2 business globally is worth trillions so guys I'll leave it there you know um, I will mention just briefly the link and tell you again it's not mandatory it's only for those people that are interested in supporting and not for anybody else you know but um, I do believe more than eight people over the last few days are capable of supporting to just choose not to because we have after all had you know in the last week over 20,000 people viewed the data on the website and we've had in the last couple of days over you know, 6,000, 7,000 people view the videos that we've put up on YouTube. I do believe that, you know, these people aren't just one in a thousand. So there's a link there if you want to help us. I really hope you do. And, um, you know, I'll say what I usually do. You take care of your loved ones. As always. Bye for now.